So this book probably requires an upfront disclaimer. It's not well-liked, for a variety of valid reasons. Some of those are structural, some have to do with the arc's continual bad pacing, some with the poor characterizations or poor associations with a variety of characters. But a large part of the criticism has to do with the group that acts as the setting for the last third of the book, the Tribe of Rushing Water. And perhaps more than any other entry in the series, this book devalues and weakens the tribe to an egregious degree, an especially upsetting thing to recognize when you also know the real-life cultural parallels that exist for that group. I am not personally qualified to discuss the real-world implications of this particular issue, so I have left a detailed document in the description that I encourage you to read if you haven't already. Even putting real-world implications aside, though, there is a fair bit to dislike about this book. I do apologize ahead of time. Outcast, the third book in the Power of Three arc, released on April 22nd of 2008, four months after the dual releases of Dark River and Warrior's Refuge. Unlike the previous two entries in this arc, this one was written by Cherith Baldry. Given her existing habit for focusing a little more on plot than character interactions where she has the opportunity to, and the fact that this arc as a whole doesn't yet seem to have a plot, this could relate to how dry many fans find the story to be. Or it could offer up an opportunity to finally jumpstart the arc's plot. We would just have to see. However, remember especially for this book that Cherith is just a ghostwriter, and it was Victoria Holmes who was plotting out all of these books with truly extensive notes that come in at dozens or hundreds of pages, especially with elements as important as what a main character's power was, how to reveal it, the choice to include the tribe, and to have them face the adversities and triumphs that they did. Vicky herself was never trying to victimize the tribe. On the contrary, sources we've seen from her as early as August 19th of 2006 and as late as June 18th of 2020 say that she designed the tribe as an arbitrary other world with different customs, beliefs, strengths, and weaknesses from the clan cats that would push the protagonists outside their comfort zones. She, rather infamously, even said that the tribe was initially designed after a certain event that took place in the United States in late 2001, not basing their culture on any involved in that event, but by having a different culture and religion interact with the clan cats without calling either side right, allowing both sides to never truly understand each other, but to accept each other anyway. On a fundamental level, I do think trying to create another cultural group rather than trying to make the tribe a group of individuals and then having them follow a certain culture was a misstep to begin with. But even beyond that, the goals she had for the tribe, however noble or secretly sinister they were, were failed by the end of this book. Just keep in mind that mutual respect and no one group being superior to the other is what she was aiming for. That's how we'll know she missed the target. Sorry about the long introduction. Fortunately, the allegiances are much quicker. Millie moved to the nursery, so there are now 15 warriors instead of 16, and three queens instead of two, but otherwise the allegiances even for the other clans are unchanged, with the only difference being the addition of the Tribe of Rushing Waters allegiances and a few more cats outside the clans. There is a total speaking cast of 79 cats, identical to Dark River, but the top 10% of the cast has 67% of the lines instead of 70%. Quite impressive. Unfortunately, the percentage of she-cat characters has dropped from 47% to 46%, and they now get only 33% of the lines, despite Hollypaw, our she-cat protagonist, having the most lines of any cat in the book. It seems the supporting and background casts will be overwhelming her this time with their overwhelming prominence of Tom's. But putting that aside, it's time to finally get into this book. Outcast begins with a prey dispute between a group of tribe cats and some invaders to their territory. The invaders tell the tribe cats that they all have rights to the prey on this mountain, since the tribe cats have no borders and therefore no real territory. Crag orders Sheer to return to their cave and say the invaders are back, and Stoneteller himself comes to order them to stop, which they do not, instead teasing the tribe cats and attacking them. The last line tells us that the tribe of Endless Hunting looks down helplessly from above, so we're already starting off with some tribe inferiority even for their ancestors. Fantastic! Back in ThunderClan, Jaypaw is thinking about Fallen Leaves and Rock, particularly the drowning that he and Fallen Leaves experience together, and he isn't paying attention to his duties or the other apprentices. Leafpool notices and asks if he's alright, but Jaypaw isn't interested in talking. 
Also, Hollypaw apparently beats Cinderpaw in training every time. And Lionpaw is doing better in training, pointedly making sure that he is the best, most loyal warrior he can be after everything in the last book. Berrypaw, Hazelpaw, and Mousepaw all pass their assessments and are made warriors. Berrynose, Hazeltail, and Mousewhisker. A relief to Berrynose, who was worried he would be named Barry Stumpytail. And Jaypaw still doesn't have much interest in the world around him. Berrynose is also now being condescending to Lionpaw, by the way. And Ashfur doesn't seem to be defending him very well. Lionpaw also hears a story about Tigerstar from Longtail, which leads him to believe that he has nothing to fear, since Tigerstar has nothing to be ambitious about anymore. Hollypaw, meanwhile, is looking at the massive, dramatic crush Honeypaw has on the now warrior Berry Nose, and considering if she would be expected to act like that and have kids one day. She doesn't think she'd want to, and asks her mom Squirrelflight about it. She answers that Hollypaw is planning too far ahead and that she should just concentrate on her training, which even Hollypaw admits doesn't help at all. While not exclusive to the identity, this conversation is probably very familiar to anyone who discovered they are asexual or aromantic. That said, we quickly move on in this book to Ice Kid and Fox Kid being apprenticed, with Fox Paw to Squirrel Flight and Ice Paw to White wi uh, Wing. Wait, what? Uh, hang on. B uh, wasn't Brightheart promised one of those two back in the site since J Paw became a Medicine Cat apprentice and she was left without one? In universe, it's only been a moon or two since then, so it is truly sad that this promise wasn't kept. Hopefully, someone will at least remember it in the future and give her a different apprentice. R right? Birchfall complains about Whitewing getting an apprentice instead of him, going off to commiserate with Berry Nose after Sandstorm tells him off. And then Hollypaw, Brackenfur, and Firestar go off on patrol, where Berry Nose and Birchfall were caught on Shadowclan's side of the border and reprimanded. Starting up the bad boy club quickly, aren't we? Blackstar also seems upset and makes a remark about the journey to the lake being a mistake. While Hollypaw is out hunting by herself, she finds Jaypaw trying to get into the tunnels. He explains what interests him about them, and Hollypaw understands, but doesn't want to risk his life trying to find answers. Brooke also tells her and Cinderpaw about how different hunting is in the mountains, and she is interested, but remarks that she'll never actually go there. Jaypaw speaks with Rock at the Medicine Cat Gathering, who is very cryptic, but tells him that he will find the answers he wants in the mountains. Leafpool also learns that the tribe is in trouble from Feathertail, but since it won't affect Thunderclan, she isn't sure if she should tell Firestar, a cat famous for absolutely never caring about anyone outside of Thunderclan, yep, yep. And when she does decide to tell him, she's still confident that he won't want to do anything. I'm glad you know your father so well, Leafpool. Lionpaw gets jealous of Berrynose and has a conversation with Stormfur about his father, Brambleclaw. Hollypaw has decided to compartmentalize her training and focus on exactly one thing at a time, like the tribe cats do, which Cinderpaw doesn't understand but is supportive of. Back to Lionpaw, he and Ashfur have a sparring match in front of some of the other apprentices and mentors, with claws unsheathed, and look like they're really trying to hurt each other until Brackenfur steps in to stop it. Ashfur praises Lionpaw and says that all the apprentices should be like that, but everyone else is shaken. Also, strange cats that we learn are from the tribe arrive by the Wingclan border. It's Talon and Knight, and between their words and j -Pod diving into their memories, we discovered that Stormfur and Brook were kicked out of and declared dead by the tribe after Stormfur's battle plan against the invaders failed, and that, since the tribe doesn't train for battle like the clan cats do, they were brutally defeated and need Stormfur and Brook to return and help. They agree reluctantly, and Squirrelflight and Brambleclaw ask to join them. With some determination and Rock's words in his head, Jaypaw secures it so he, Lionpaw, and Hollypaw can come too. And they also add on Tawny Pelt and Crowfeather, the other members of the new prophecy journey, and Crowfeather's son, Breezepaw, who does not actually want to go. None of our protagonists like him and his attitude either, but they also don't care for Crowfeather's grumpiness. After a tense moment between Crowfeather and Leafpool, the group heads out. Along the way, Breezepaw bemoans needing to help the tribe. It's a chore, and they aren't sure why they need to do it when the tribe doesn't do anything for them. Crowfeather brings up Feathertail's sacrifice and says Breezepaw will never understand loyalty. No one brings up what the tribe did do for them, sheltering all four clans during the Great Journey. <sighs> they also meet Purdy again for the first time since dawn. The adults are happy to see him again and reintroduce themselves, but the apprentices are unimpressed, and especially annoyed when Purdy insists on joining them all for the journey. 
However, as he successfully explains strange new creatures to them and then saves them from a dog attack they ran into while sneaking away from the group, the apprentices learn to get a little more respect for him, just in time for them to break apart as they reach the mountains. They have a run-in with the intruders that Hollypaw accidentally brought to them. Talon and Knight explain that Stone Teller has ordered them not to challenge the intruders, since they can't afford a battle. Breezepaw is still definitely not getting along with Crowfeather or Lionpaw. And finally, as we reach chapter 20 of this 29-chapter book, we get to the tribe of Rushing Water, only to find out that they weren't welcome or expected. The tribe is now being characterized as a completely vulnerable entity who is too stubborn and prideful to even be told that these cats came to offer them necessary help. Wonderful. Perfect. This is exactly what they needed. <laughs> Crowfeather mourns Feathertail at her grave. Jaypaw is certain that the three are meant to be here for their own personal reasons, and then we get to meet Stone Teller, who is furious to see the cats he banished returned. He not only berates the visitors, but his own cats, Talon and Knight, for going to find them. He tells Brooke that he didn't take the decision lightly, but that their ancestors willed them to be exiled. And Brooke, Brooke, tells him that their ancestors are wrong because the tribe is suffering more than ever. I'm sorry, but if you have any goals of making these societies equal, having the leader blame a cruel decision on the words of their ancestors, or having the ancestors make that choice, but having a cat originally from that culture decry the ancestors as wrong, is not your best move. Much as they can be just as cruel and irrational, no one ever calls Star Clan wrong. Brambleclaw then insists, as Stormfur did before the exile, that the tribe must mark their borders like the clans do to solve this problem. And everyone on the clans patrol defends Stormfur and says the tribe needs help. Guys, guys, you are literally saying that the tribe's cultural techniques have failed and they must take on the superior clan techniques to survive. These are not equal! Please stop! <laughs> Our protagonists get to know the tribe's apprentices, by which I mean that we learn their names and that they bicker generically, as young cats often do. And both groups explain their cultural differences to each other. Jaypaw intrudes on Stone Teller's dream with his ancestors, who are saying that they were wrong and they must leave because the mountains aren't safe. Oh, great, we're even devaluing their home, the thing that most sets them apart now, huh? Before the ancestors themselves recognize Jaypaw and lead him away to tell him to take their message to the tribe that they must accept the clan's help. A different message than what they just said to Stone Teller. Even their bloody ancestors think the clan cats are more special, superior, and necessary for the tribe's survival than the tribe's own cats. The clan cats, led by Brambleclaw, quickly set up a system by which the tribe will start to conform to the clan values by learning to fight, set up and maintain borders, and concede some of their territory to the intruders who have been terrorizing and disrespecting them. A couple of the tribe cats call out that this will be the end of their own personal culture, but everyone in the clan group thinks that's silly and they have no choice but to pick the right option of the better clan traditions. My goodness, how does this not sound wrong to anyone? Craig speaks up and agrees that they must change and abandon their traditions because it is more important that they survive than that they don't become a clan. Brambleclaw then asks Lionpaw, Hollypaw, and Breezepaw to train the tribe's tubies in clan battle techniques. A patrol goes out to consider where the boundaries could be, but are still convinced that the intruders won't obey them. Which they will not! The training the tubies thing happens, with the apprentices suddenly acting as mentors for cats their own age, and this gives Jaypaw a chance to go and speak with Stone Teller, who feels defeated and like his ancestors are abandoning him. Which they sort of are, calling in clan cats again to solve a problem that neither they nor the tribe can deal with. Rock then comes in to be the worst person again and tell him to stop caring about or comforting the cats of the tribe and just be proud that his clan and his siblings are taking care of the problem. Also, because the prey hunters didn't have any cave guards with them since they were off training, there wasn't anyone to fight off the eagles and one of them was injured. Stone Teller is ready to leave until Brambleclaw convinces him to take on the clan's traditions they've been working on and finally, after actually marking the borders, they form a battle patrol to back up those borders. Reminder that this is the exact plain Stormfur proposed that got him kicked out because the tribe cats couldn't handle the battle. The intruders say they don't care about the borders the tribe set, declare this battle to be life or death, and declare war. The tribe repairs themselves, Jaypaw insists that his littermates must not die, and the battle begins. Lionpaw, a super-powered apprentice from the clans, goes into a frenzy and defeats a majority of the intruders on his own. He also seems to have come out unharmed himself, aside from being tired. 
The intruders concede to respect the tribe's borders. Breeze Paul says that the tribe will be forever grateful to the clan cats, and they prepare to go home. Rock comes to J-Paw again while he's trying to comfort Stone Teller and says that they won the battle and can go home now. J-Paw says maybe this will restore the tribe's faith in their ancestors, and Rock says, and I quote, Why should they? It was the clans who saved the tribe of Rushing Water. He says they were expecting J-Paw and the others for a long time, and they have finally come. The tribe didn't even matter. It was a means to an end. J-Paw then decides to tell his siblings about the prophecy, but the book cuts off before he does. In a way, it's a shame that everything with the tribe is what it is, because this book, especially in the first section, has some of the most iconic moments of the arc. Berry Paw fearing his warrior name would be Stumpy Tail, Holly Paw showing off her not quite canon asexuality, J Paw's bonding with Holly Paw over finally having someone to tell about Fallen Leaves and Rock, Lion Paw getting jealous of Berry Nose for now getting Honey Paw and Poppy Paw's attention, the bits of foreshadowing and Ashford's behavior. All of these are great moments that really enrich the cast and make us love these characters and their relationships all that much more. Even after this, the journey itself was richer than anything the new prophecy had to offer because of the distinct personalities and conversations of most cats on the journey, and the actions they would personally choose to take to divert the journey or express their opinions on it. Power of Three continues to show why people do like it, even outside of nostalgia. It can be really charming, and it's very easy to catch on to who all of the characters are and what their relationships are like, even as they change. But it's really impossible to ignore all of the other stuff in this book. Most of the richness and characterization that we do get is from the protagonists and a dash of Breezepaw and Crowfeather. Not from Tawny Pelt or the Three's parents, and definitely not from the Tribe Cats. Brooke and Stoneteller are the only Tribe Cats who even show a remote speck of personality, and they boil down to loving and loyal for Brooke and cruel and vulnerable for Stoneteller. Everyone else in the tribe works in a sort of mob fashion where they say whatever is necessary in the moment to properly bounce off of the clan cats and stone teller. Save for Crag, who by happenstance always sides with the clan cats at the expense of his own tribe and their traditions. And of course, the inferiority displayed in this book is abysmal. The tribe as a group may well never be able to recover from this period where they had to grovel to clan cats twice and stubbornly refuse their necessary help, bending backwards to change themselves and be more like the clan cats to fight off a group of cats who couldn't actually care less if they have borders or not. Their behavior later in the book proved that the invaders only really prodded them about their territory to be mean. They would have used it regardless, and the only thing that made them change their mind was a superpowered child from the clans that even the tribe's ancestors have apparently been waiting for. This is the nail in the coffin for the tribe ever being the clan's equal, and it leaves a sour taste, even as it means the recognition of what Lion Paul's part in the prophecy is. On a somewhat related note, the pacing of this arc continues to lag behind massively. In the first 13 chapters of the book, before anyone even left the lake, nothing of substance happened. Certainly not to do with the Dark Forest, the prophecy, or any notable overarching plot. In fact, this book only gives Tiger Star three lines and Hawkfrost one. Not nearly enough time to set up any meaningful progression in their relationship with Lionpaw. And the entire Save the Tribe storyline, in addition to being a misstep in execution, fails on principle because it halts the plot completely when it had barely started in the last book. Even then, with how they don't actually get to leave the mountains by the end of the book, and the last chapter ends with j Paw being cut off before he can tell his littermates about the prophecy this arc is supposedly based around, it feels like they ran out of time and will have to carry over into the next book. But they only ran out of time because they wasted it on almost nothing of significance. If someone read Dark River and you handed them a clips next, they would still understand the whole story. The only necessary piece to this puzzle is Lionpaw showing off his power, but this is far from the last time he will show it off, and he will in fact get another chance in the very next book. So this entire story ends up feeling like a waste. Despite some fun moments and strong characterization for our main characters and their relationships, Outcast still fails on its own merits, in continuing the goals of the tribe and in furthering the story of its arc. Some of those moments are fun to show out of context, but it is overall not a book that is worth your time by any means. Half of the arc is over, and there is still no clear direction in sight. 
But the next book, Eclipse, may just change that. Or at least, it may be forced to. There is one last Greystripe manga to go, but we will soon return to this story and find out what is made of it in the future episodes of our trip through time. Oh.